Welcome everybody to Q&A, our Aliens Among Us Q&A. This is uh, hosted by the Invasive Species Council. I'm Andrew Cox, the CEO of the Invasive Species Council, and really a big welcome to everybody. This is <laughs> our ninth Q&A, and I'm coming to you from Gandagara and Darak country. Pay my respect to the elders of that country. And we are going to do some truth telling. We're going to talk about the story of invasive species and the damage they wrought on this continent. So let's get started. Today, we've got our special guest, Guy Hull. Guy wrote a book called The Ferals Ate Australia. Guy not only is he an author, he's a cabinet maker, a dog behaviorist, and a dog trainer. Welcome, Guy. Thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here. And also on our panel to help us navigate the issues that Guy's talked about in his book, we've got Richard Swain, Indigenous Ambassador, Associate Professor at ANU, and co-founder of the Reclaim Cozy Campaign. Welcome, Richard. Hello, Andrew. Thank, thanks for having me. I didn't mention, Richard, you're a Wiradjuri man, so uh, uh, welcome, a special welcome to you. <laughs> Tim Lowe is a second panellist. He's an author, ecologist, co-founder of the Invasive Species Council and wrote a couple of uh, well-known books, Feral Future and Where Song Began. Welcome, Tim. Um, thank you, Andrew. Great to be back. And our third panelist uh, is Dr. Carol Booth. She's the Invasive Species Council Principal Policy Analyst, a writer, a philosopher, and has a long association with the Invasive Species Council um, for most of its years. So welcome, Carol. Hi, everyone. Great. Well, let's get into it. It's um, We've got a, quite a lot of ground to cover because Guy's book is a pretty... Uh, colourful accounts of how Australia ended up with so many feral animals. Um, while this led to major ecological damage, what's interesting is it could have been a whole lot worse. So, Guy, this is not your first book. In 2018, you published the highly successful book, The Dogs That Made Australia. You know a lot about dogs, but why did you feel like you had to write about a book about Australia's ferals? Well, that's an interesting question, Andrew. Um, I grew up in Western New South Wales. I was from a family of hunters and landowners, and I'd um, done my fair share of um, hunting feral animals because, you know, as far as sporting species are concerned, the introduced animals are the only things worth chasing. So I, you know, my father grew up during the you know rapid plagues, you know during the depression era, and I heard all of those stories, and I hunted you know rabbits and foxes and goats, pigs and you know cats and you name it and hares, and um, I just had an interest in those animals. I spent a lot of time watching those animals, even more so than pulling the trigger half the time because I'm just interested in animals. So. I became interested in their habits and what they did. I was a pretty successful hunter because I could generally work out where I'd find them at any given time. And so as I developed my literary skills later in life, I, after I'd written my dog book, I thought that there was a needed to be told again. I, I loved Eric Rolls as they all ran wild. I was fascinated with that book and still love it. And it was a monumental work really. And that, that I found that, you know, pretty early in life and, um, that had a pretty profound effect on me, but I just kind of thought that maybe the story after, you know, my publishers said, you know, like everyone loves your dog book, God, you want to write something else? I said, oh, well, yeah, I wouldn't mind writing about feral animals. So that's how that book came about. So it was a, a very interesting exercise. It was a heartbreaking exercise, really, to see how Australia and its original inhabitants, inhabitants had been treated with a disregard complete disregard everyone and everything had been treated um dealt with so yeah you know, i just thought i'd take up the cudgels a bit and and tell that story as i knew it in my way 
Thanks, Guy. Look, for those who have just joined us, uh, we're talking to Guy Hull, uh, author of this book here, The Ferals That Ate Australia. I highly recommend it as a great read. It it's You, you keep uh, the interest all the way through the book. It's a really, uh, well, not just fascinating, but tragic and almost absurd sort of story of all these, these introductions that have occurred. So thanks for writing this, Thank Guy. You. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure to do it. And just uh, this is uh, this webinar. We've got about 150 people joined us already, which is pretty incredible. Um, this is an interactive uh, aliens among us. There's, it's a Q and A. So if you've got some questions for Guy or the panelists, Tim Lowe, Carol Booth, or Richard Swain, you can put it in not in the chat, but in the Q and A button, or it's under the more option. The Q&A is where you ask your questions, and that allows the panellists to see them. It allows us to answer them. And those questions we don't get to today, we'll also post the answers on our website. So let's uh, let's speak to another author with us. Um, we've got Tim Lowe um, on the panel. He wrote a, a pretty um, important book for our organisation, Feral Future, because it was the book that led to the establishment of the Invasive Species Council. It was the wake up call to environmentalists saying, you've got this big issue under your noses and you better be working on this, this major threat to our uh, to nature. Tim, as an author, tell us why you were motivated to write Feral Future in 1999. Yeah, I, I think you kind of summed it up fairly well that it was a call to the conservation movement so that I think at that time there was a really strong perception that um, Australia had learned from its mistakes. So prickly pear, uh, cane toads, rabbits, foxes, people knew that these had been disasters and Australia was seen as a global leader in quarantine. I mean, this is before the word biosecurity had really taken over. Uh, we were a leader in biological control. So I feel there was a real sense of complacency that we'd learned from the mistakes, that we were doing what was right, and that I was looking around and thinking there's rampant environmental weeds spread. Uh, there are all these marine invasions that no one in the conservation movement has any conception about. In actual fact, you can take what is an old story and, um, uh, yeah, just tell it, tell it afresh. And, um, yeah, and so I was very very critical of the gardening industry, uh, a whole pastoral industry, uh, but particularly the conservation movement. And yeah, it was wonderful that um, uh, Barry Trail from the conservation movement approached me and said, yeah, there, there should be more conservation activism in this area, hence um, the Invasive Species Council. And Tim, you're writing a new book because so much has changed since 1999 about the same topic. Do you want to quickly tell us what book you're writing right now? Um, yeah, it's, it's a struggle knowing what to leave out because uh, Richard, I uh, read Richard's, um, uh, sorry, got Guy's book, um, it's a great ripping yarn. Um, he's told the history. I mean, you could just easily fill a book with what has happened since Royal Future came out in 1999. So many new issues or issues that, when I wrote that, it was difficult to find any evidence that deer were a problem. Was no, no one would dispute that now. Um, but yeah, the sense that with globalization, uh, the movement of species is really out of control. I'm going to start just by briefly mentioning COVID as evidence of that. Um, but yeah, you know, just think of COVID as a human pathogen that had global impacts. All of the um, uh, pathogens traveling the world that are capable of causing extinctions of plants and animals it's really quite terrifying and people don't have a sense of what is out there and you know the thought that the next extinctions in australia could actually be caused by pathogens that are not in australia right now yeah it's pretty sobering thanks tim um good luck for that new book um to talk the modern invasions and to retell the story of feral future I'm going to come back to Guy because I wanted to start from the beginning. The beginning being when 11 ships sailed into the Sydney Cove in 1788. I mean, we all know it as Australians, Guy, this, this the arrival of uh, all the convicts and the soldiers and, uh, you know, to, set a, to, to, to take the land 
um, and start a colony. But what wasn't really understood is what that process unleashed. Um, there were ferals aboard those ships, right? Um, feral, what we call now feral animals. Um, what, what ferals were aboard that ship that created the first invasive species problems? Oh, uh, British people, really, Andrew. They were, the, <laughs> they were the biggest feral problem that came with that fleet. Um, uh, besides the uh, the human ferals, there was, um, you know, of course there was the vermin that, well, the vermin, that, that four-legged vermin that came. There were rats and mice. They brought every animal, if it's not Australian native animal, it's feral. So whatever they brought with them was feral, whether it be livestock, Livestock did very, very badly. They brought they brought sheep that were, in, you know, um, cape sheep that were infected with scab. They all died pretty quickly. They brought pigs that were hit by lightning. If that wasn't a message from someone, I don't know what was going on there. <clears throat> Pardon me. And um, so they brought poultry, and they, but every one of the, one of the things was is that nothing that they brought at that time had really any hope. Of um, of succeeding, except for the cattle that escaped and you know bred up, but you know that was a short lived, short and sweet story, really. But the cattle, the cattle managed to survive, and I suppose in doing that, the cattle cattle also showed that if you're going to try and get into pastoralism at all, cattle were going to work because you know dingoes took care of every dingoes and quolls. Birds of prey, the reptiles took care of everything. They tried to establish little rabbit colonies for a long, long time out of domestic rabbits, and they just couldn't do it because just nothing would last. And so they yeah. didn't cause a whole lot of well, where they plonked themselves without invitation was someone's someone's territory or something's territory. It was indigenous people's territory. It was dingo's territory. It was all shared. All, all the shared occupancy, you know, trees mm. were felled, birds' nests were destroyed. The destruction started from the moment they they arrived and they couldn't help destroying things. Just by being there, they destroyed things. They fouled up that beautiful little stream in no time and it became a, you know, running sewer. No matter what they did, they destroyed things. They were bulk netting fish and, you know, killing animals and birds and whatever. So anything that came anywhere near their beautiful productions, which would dwindling fast was had to be killed and disposed mm. of so they were fighting the elements for a start yeah well, i guess they brought that survival um but also that exploitation culture with them maybe i might be a good time to bring in richard swain um richard um i mean mm. we've just heard that the arrival of the humans in 1788 from uh england the but it was an occupied country already an occupied continent this mm. was the start of australia's invasion and the start of ecological catastrophe richard tell us what that moment means to you oh you know sydney harbour was a paradise and <clears throat> the aussies now like to say their fifth generation or something and that tank stream that they they went there for they probably <laughs> uh, who knows how many thousand generations of people were drank from that stream and it was destroyed within six months and and it's still destroyed to this day. Uh, I, I think all of that happened and, and the British did it or, or in other places it happened, but I think the hardest pill now in 2024 is that we knew very quickly what invasive species did. <clears throat> we knew very quickly that this continent wasn't handling the booted foot, the hard hoof, the matchstick and the strychnine. And so at any given time in the last two centuries, we could have switched to a, a more respectful culture and a culture that wanted to live with, with, this, with this continent and its species and its soil and water. And I think that's the hardest part for me now is that we are still behaving no, not much differently to 1788. We still haven't accepted the, the responsibility that comes with custodianship. Yeah, well, that's a big choice we didn't make. Um, I'll just come back to this this event. This is a Q and A, so we want your questions. And already, many people are putting in questions in the Q and A. Please use the Q and A tab, not the 
chat tab. We only take questions if you enter them under the Q&A part of the menu. And maybe this is a good time also now to bring in Carol Booth, um, the Invasive Species Council's principal policy analyst, because a few of the questions that have been talking a bit about um, the different species that have arrived and which ones are the worst are fire ants the biggest threat. But I just, this, Carol, I wanted to ask you a bit about the invasion process because it's not widely understood by many people about uh, how are some species, like I said, didn't establish and some did um, when they the, the colonists first arrived, but also these experiments where people were trying to set wild rabbits and other things. So talk a bit about, Carol, if you can, about how this works, how how invasion actually takes place in, in, the, in the wild. For an animal that's newly introduced to the wild or a species, whether it is, survives or not, is really a combination of biology and luck. And, you know, there are quite a few species that were released and didn't establish in Australia. And we can be really thankful for that. We could have had three times as many deer species. We could have had zebras and antelopes. We could have had mongooses, weasels, stoats. But for new escapees, survival, survival can be tough. Evading predators, finding mates, landing up in a place with suitable habitat or climate. And, you know, for a tiny founding population, if there are only a very few, life is precarious. One bad event, fire, drought, disease can wipe you out. And then if you've only got a small population, you might die out from inbreeding. And one fundamental principle in invasion biology is that the higher the propagule pressure, which is the number and the frequency of introductions to the wild, the more likely a species is to establish. And so for a lot of ones that didn't establish, there just weren't that many introduction events. Carol, can you um, help explain what the word propagule means? Yeah, so it's it's the the number and the frequency of introductions. So the more animals that are introduced and or the greater the number of times they're introduced, that that's the, the propagule pressure, then the more likely they are to establish. So, you know, almost anything yeah. can establish in Australia. And the more, the longer something is in Australia, the more likely it is to establish. And that's, that's definitely the case with a lot of weeds. There's this really clear relationship. If a species has been here a long time, it will eventually find the right place to establish. So we've got to stop the propagules. That's, that's really the, the nub of this, the, the, the seeds and the, the offspring from the, the, the invaders. Yep. Good. All right. Thanks. That's that's a great explanation. I might just um, I might just come back to Guy um, because um, Guy, you write about the link between pastoralism and the desire to remove native predators. Um, this is a little bit after. Well, I guess as soon as they found some sheep that didn't die of disease, um, and they found the expansive grazing lands once they got west of the divide, the Great Dividing Range. And there seemed to be a, a, a mass culling of dingoes and quolls and eagles, the other predators, the native predators. So why is this significant to the story of Australia's feral invasions? Yeah, that's a, another good question. It, um, it's all tied, this problem goes back a long centuries back. It's it's a problem rooted in what was known as the Tudor faunal law, wildlife laws. They were first started by King Henry VIII, who uh, outlawed uh, birds of the corvid species, crows and chuffs and ravens and things like that, because allegedly they were eating, they had a couple of bad halves, so they landed on the birds and they were black, so they, that'd be bad. So they got rid of those. And then Elizabeth, his daughter, uh, broadened that to basically every native animal there were bounties paid you were obliged by law to do it and that law those laws remained in place until just before australia was colonized new south wales was colonized and people even though those laws were eventually repealed 
the people who came to Australia just saw everything that was native as being useless and a problem. And I suppose if you want to raise sheep in this country, the native predators were a problem and always will be a problem. So no matter where they went, they, they, it was conservation for their own resources and pro, uh, proglyphacy. They would just would ex, get rid of any tiny thing that we created a problem, whether that be vegetation with, you know, ridiculous clearing, no understanding how the land worked. They would destroy any competition for grazing animals and they destroyed any predators that would have any effect on their grazing animals. And in doing that with, with arsenic first and then strychnine, they wiped out, you know, the bike kill was just mind bogglingly atrocious. So, to What's try and make, try and make wool production, wool growing work, they had to just get rid of everything. What I thought was really interesting when you write about that is it sort of like sets Australia up to be invaded by the things that were being introduced. Because you mentioned before that they tried maybe up to a hundred times to try to introduce the rabbit before 1926. This is what you you, you wrote, but then we did introduce the rabbit, and it did spread throughout Australia and the fox. And you write about the fact that we removed all of these native predators was probably one of the main reasons why these spe these introduced species really got, got a toehold and got such an edge in the pastoral country where these native predators weren't there to suppress them. Is, is that the way you see it? Yeah, exactly the way I see it. It, um, it paved the way getting rid of the predators paved the way for the rabbit and then the rabbit paved the way for the fox, which came about 11 years after it had first spread and there was no stopping it. But then again, you see, it was just the whole system was rotten. The wool industry was just a rotten system. There was, it's feudalism. I look at it as feudalism being, you know, in, 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 in the antipodes. It was squatters you know who did it hard in the first place became you know fat 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 on the on wool there was a few the properties became very large there was only a few properties relatively few properties around towns they employed seasonal laborers uh, you know once they were established of course they had fencing and all infrastructure to construct so there was all there was a lot of work for a while for people but probably more work they could handle but after a while, they would just hire people seasonally when they needed them, and a few people. So when these poor, when the poor townspeople saw people were actually they they became a, a industry built on the rabbit. The spread of the rabbit was enhanced by people going to rabbit infested areas, catching rabbits, and seeding their own local area with them, so they could then start trapping rabbits for skins and meat and. So unfortunately, the wool growers lost a lot of business. They were squealing about it like like no one's business. But people, I, I remember reading one fellow said, I, "I was lucky to get by, you know, like working for for the local cockies. But now I've been to the you know the Tommy Burns fight in Sydney three times, and I've been to the you know cricket test matches. I've been here and there, I've taken my family on holidays, and he was living eye on the hog. It was a pretty dirty job trapping rabbits, but it actually created work for people for a while, and it." It was a very, very strong competitor, but but then once mm. once sheep had destroyed the place, then rabbits came over after them and totally totally wrecked the place. So it's wreaked a level of destruction we'd never seen. Yeah, we'll come back to that in a, in a minute. I might come to Carol next um, because I've we've just talked about the removal of the native predators. Um, there's a couple of questions that are asking. Uh, one question in particular says: Are rats and mice an invasive species. Um, Carol might be able to answer that, but Carol, I want to ask you the next question, which is, are dingoes an invasive species or are they a native species? They arrived about 5,000 years ago. How should we regard dingoes? I'm asking Carol. She's dropped out. Oh, we've lost Carol. Out. Tim, Andrew. Tim, do you want to have a go at answering that question? Uh, are dingoes native? I think it depends on how you want to define it and that I don't know that I'll ever get a consensus on that question. I mean, I, I would say that if something is introduced by people, it is an introduced species. But look, Carol, well, Carol's back, so we can yeah. hand the question over. Carol, did you hear the question? 
Yeah, I did. Yeah. And as Tim said, it definitely depends on definitions. And these definitions vary widely in Australia. You've got a couple of jurisdictions that just say a species is native if it arrived prior to 1788, for example, or 1500. But, you know, clearly there's no real um, contention that they're introduced because they had to get here with the aid of people and based on fossil evidence have been here probably about three and a half thousand years. And again, according to definitions, depending on which definition you use, because they also cause some harm, you know, they prey on certain threatened species. The definition that's used by the IUCN, the International Union for Nature Conservation and by the Invasive Species Council, they do qualify as invasive. But on the other hand, you know, they are a pretty special case and if dingoes were restored across the landscape, Australia wouldn't have a goat problem. And we wouldn't have as much vegetation degradation because at least some of that's caused by overabundant kangaroos. And so for these reasons and others, there are really good reasons to protect dingoes, but also ensuring that rare mammals that might be at risk are also yeah. protected. Yeah, thanks, Carol. Great explanation. And, and the, the question about rats and mice, um, rats and mice clearly are invasive species, but they're particularly um, a problem on islands and they have been responsible, particularly the rats, for the extinction of a number of, of birds. Um, so yes, they are definitely a serious problem. I might um, come to Richard because I wanted to talk to him about the dingo or even just native predators in general. And to ask Richard, Richard, um, how important are, are native predators to the health of country? Oh, well, <clears throat> I agree with what Carol said 100%. Uh, um, <clears throat> there are certain remote areas where the mirigar and the dingo are, are left alone in, in some national parks because they, they, they bait the boundaries. So KMP is a good example of that. They bait, bait the but there's healthy populations in, in, in the centre areas. But not being an ecologist, I, I feel that, it, you know, everything's under pressure. I, you know, I was employed to uh, trap cats in critically endangered Smoky Mouse territory. And there's a fine line between getting cats and foxes and not, not getting the dingo. But I, I, I don't have the law of healing country. I, I think moving forward... If we're going to try and in, reintroduce species and 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 try, I think the ding, dingo would have to be really well managed and brought in at the appropriate times and, and in appropriate landscapes. So I I don't I, I don't um, believe we'd be able to reintroduce species while they're under any pressure, be that from the dingo, the cat, or the fox. So that's that's sort of where I sit with it. Thanks, Richard. I'm going to just shift um, a gear a bit and talk about this phase of Australia's history in the 1860s, which was the start of the acclimatisation movement. It's a pretty tragic period that um, we covered that in our first Aliens Among Us webinar, where we interviewed an author of a book about that period. But I thought um, it might be worth just hearing again a little bit about that from Guy because uh, you write about Edward Wilson, Guy, where who's, he had a motto, if it lives, we want it. Mm. Uh, tell us about the influence of Edward Wilson and what uh, and a, bit, a bit about the acclimatization, the acclimatization movement. The acclimatization movement was, well, I'll be frank, well, it started by cashed up bogans. That's a big feral problem. It started by people who couldn't make it in England, came over here and made money, worked hard and made money out of wool and set themselves up in mansions. And then because there's this derisive attitude towards Australian wildlife and fauna in general, that uh, what we had wasn't good enough for them. So, they, of course, they, being British, they had a great Roman... Roman instilled love of blood sports. And so they decided that they would set up their own little, their own little um, hunting preserves in Australia, in a country that wasn't able to cope with the, uh, the pressure of these animals that they brought over. So 
Wilson had a newspaper called the Argus and he was mad on acclimatization. He was like the godfather of the Victorian acclimatization society, which was the most damaging one. All the other uh, colonies that had it, Queensland was almost useless. New South Wales, well, they were all too stingy to do anything with their money. All the new money from, from, you see, it all goes back to, it also goes back to the story of the dingo as well. Around, the, around in Victoria, it was easy for them to get rid of the dingo. They didn't have the great dividing range to deal with. They had all this open country and it was very easy for them to get rid of the dingo. So they cleaned the place out. And that was the ideal place to start destroying Australia because all the predators have gone, as we've already discussed. And because of that, they were able with confidence. They, so Thomas Austin, who had Barwon Park, he employed a, a gamekeeper. They just destroyed, hunted native animals like right off the place, birds of prey, everything. He got his rabbits, he got his other animals and birds and game birds and bred them up there. And obviously they couldn't contain them, but it was, they had a, the acclimatisation societies were feral animal uh, distribution centres. Austin, anyone who was able to release rabbits on their place, Austin would look after them and, and, and pass them on to him. The Chernsides, who were down the road a bit at Werribee with foxes, they didn't share their foxes around, but they didn't need to because the foxes just went to everyone, just jumped over the fences and went to everyone else. So it didn't take them long, those societies. Look, as Carol said before, we're just so lucky that most of their harebrained, half-witted schemes and ideas just didn't work out. Or they... Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, look, that's... Uh, you've summed that up really well. Tim, I'll come to you. Um, to what extent does the acclimatisation thinking still live on in Australia? I think almost all of the acclimatisation societies no longer exist, although one or two of them are morphed into trout trout and fishing clubs um, who still exist, but that's their primary role. And luckily our laws have caught up and prevent most of this for the introdu deliberate introduction of mammals. How, Tim, just tell us whether that thinking still lives on. I mean, certainly, yeah, the climatisation societies, they still exist under that name, but the Ballarat Fish Acclimatisation Society celebrating 100 years of operation in 2020. Monaro Acclimatisation Society has got 19 branches in Cooma, Yass, Jindabyne and so on. As you say, they're, they're about trout releases, but it's interesting that they've kept the original name, that they're not shamed by it. I mean, the Cooma Trout Acclimatisation Society only dates back to the 1950s, so um, it's sort of interesting that they're using those names. Um, there's still a um, problem for conservation, so the Monaro uh, president was very angry last year about restrictions imposed on trout stocking uh, to conserve endangered galaxias and Macquarie perch. So um, they are still a problem in terms of um, um, moving forward with conservation in Australia. But I also think that acclimatisation thinking, it lives on very strongly in the permaculture movement. So permaculture sees itself as an alternative to mainstream agriculture and a very strong interest in alternative plants, and thinking that uh, mainstream agriculture is is boring, doctrinaire, and so a very um, interest in unusual, obscure plants. Some of these are not really um, domesticated, so they're, they're very easily spread into the wild, and so uh, it's to permaculture that I would see as carrying the, the mantle. I mean, not all permaculture groups. There are some that are very uh, cautious about weeds, but... Um, uh, some some of them some of them are not at all. They they welcome invasiveness as evidence of plants mm. integrating into landscapes. So, so yeah, I think that history is important, not just to tell us about the past, but um, you know it does it, it does carry on that the ideas of the past are still alive and well. Yeah, thanks thanks Tim. Um, just a reminder: this is a Q and A webinar, Aliens Among Us, and we've got. Uh, the author Guy Hull talking about the ferals that ate Australia and panellists Tim Lowe, Carol Booth and Richard Swain. And if you want any questions, put in the Q&A down the bottom, not the chat, but the Q&A. And there's one particular question I want to come to, which sort of, uh, it's directed to Richard, Richard Swain, um, our Indigenous ambassador, 
Uh, it, it's from Leanne Willows, who refers to the referendum process that helped uh, improve her awareness about the um, the destruction of Indigenous culture and heritage. Richard, what does the attitude of the acclimatizers say to you about Australia's culture at the time? And uh, maybe you might have seen that question. You might want to comment on that as well. Oh, uh, I think, are we talking about the referendum here or the... Well, I guess it's about the attitude of people to uh, yeah. Indigenous culture. It's, it's, yeah, we, you can I talk felt, about it. Yeah. I felt during the, the referendum that it was uh, people-centric. I felt the Uluru Statement, a great, great document, great statement, but it's people-centric. And, and so I feel that country didn't get to have a say in that. Uh, you know, it, <clears throat> Aboriginal culture was seen as only people. It wasn't seen as the soil, the water and the flora and fauna that, that evolved here. And for me, that's the common ground. That's that was that should have been what was offered to modern Australians. Some um, that common ground that they can accept the responsibility of custodianship and and start to feel that they're part of this this system, you know, this um, ecology here. So I felt that while ever it was people centric, I, I, nature was always going to have a loss. And when nature loses, we lose. So that, that's how I felt about that. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, I might just move on a bit because um, Guy talked a bit about those two uh, quite major introductions in the climatization period from uh, the areas around Victoria by uh, you know, the, the rabbit and the foxes. Um, and we touched on this a bit earlier because what we had there was when the rabbits spread throughout large parts of Australia and there was lots of fighting going on around who's, who's responsible. Um, Guy talked about what it spawned. Uh, he said in his book, the rabbit industry that was created was a compromised workforce dependent on the flourishing of a bio-invader. Bio so this big industry that was created by the rabbit plague, which gave lots of jobs providing cheap fur, cheap food and fur and felt hats and a ready income for the poor. Maybe um, Guy, do you wanna just briefly talk about this dependency that was created for um, because the rabbit now was across the landscape and was creating so much, so much benefit to many people. Well, the whole the whole story, as we know, of colonisation was just a mess, an ill-planned, ill-conceived mess in a land that was never able to cope with the great impositions imposed on it. So. People, people started towns and townships because of wool. But then wool became very exclusive and didn't hire very many people. But the inordinate amount of damage, let's talk about feral animals. We can't forget about sheep because sheep are probably, probably arguably the most damaging feral animal that we've ever had. And so people in those towns were subject to limited employment and when they saw an opportunity, no one cared about the environment or Indigenous people. No one, no one could give two hoots about it. Everything was stolen. Everything was, was appropriated for people's own use. Everything was disrespected. And so when people saw an opportunity to be able to, to make a living for themselves, other than if you're in a town, other than if you're a shopkeeper or, you know, you ran some essential business or service, most people were, were, were struggling to make ends meet and they just create, made that, they exacerbated that problem. And you can probably understand why they did it, but they needed to create industry around themselves and which at the same time 
knocked Wall for a six and Wall didn't know, really know how to cope with that. So there was those two industries were at each other's throats for, for quite a long while and emascul it emasculated Wall for quite a while. And But, of course, they ended up, they ended up winning to some extent because of myxomatosis. But the, the rabbit plague spread as far as rabbits were able to survive in numbers. But most of the, the rapidity of, the, of that spread was enhanced by people seeding areas. Mm. Well, I noticed there was a question about um, pigs arriving in new areas, most likely introduced by hunters. Um, I might start to talk about some positives for a moment because there's some pretty, the, invasion, the story of invasion is a pretty sad one. I might come to Carol um, because I guess this is where the rabbit problem brought out the best of us sometimes. Um, we have the vested interests that were um, needed to be overcome, but there's one particular woman, Dr. Jean McNamara, who really uh, worked very hard to try to help solve this problem. Carol, can you uh, talk a bit about the legacy of Dr. Jean McNamara? Yes, very pleased to um, talk about a very impressive woman. Um, so, I mean, one of the perversities of conservation in this very mixed up world is that European rabbits are endangered in their native range in Spain, Portugal, France, mainly because... Oh, with Carol. Um, I might come back to her if she rejoins us because I was really just really looking forward to her answer. Um, let's just keep going and we'll bring her on if she, she, she rejoins. Sorry about that. Carol's calling from a remote back. area. You're back. Do you want to keep going, Carol? Yes. Sorry about that. Every time I start speaking, I disappear. Um, yeah, so <laughs> the, the perversity, what we rely on in Australia to control rabbits is what's endangering them in their native range. But Jean McNamara, in the 1930s, she became a, a doctor and medical researcher. And when she was visiting an American university, she met a researcher who was doing work on myxomatosis in rabbits. And he was trying to immunize domestic rabbits against the disease. And that gave her the idea of using the myxoma virus to combat uh, Australia's rabbit problem. Um, she wasn't the first to propose it, but when she returned to Australia, advocate, you know, she was really. That's a pity. We've lost her, Carol, again. Um, we'll come back to Carol if she rejoins us. Um, she does have, she relies on satellite internet. So, uh, and she said, told me earlier it was a cloudy day. So we'll just have to um, keep persevering. While we wait for Carol, I might just, just change subject a little bit to talk about. Oh, Carol's with us. Do you want to just finish your <laughs> Carol? You have yeah. a go. Yeah. I'm so sorry about this, everyone. So yeah, Jean, she was this really strong advocate for using the virus uh, as a biocontrol agent, and the CSIRO started doing research and tri trialed it, and it didn't didn't work. So they gave up on it, but she kept persevering, uh, saying that they hadn't done enough work on it. And eventually they did do another trial and it worked this time because it was in a wetter area and there was a wet period when there were lots of mosquitoes that could transport the virus. So um, we know that she, now that how right she was to really push on this idea because the, the Myxoma virus really had an amazing effect on reducing rabbit problems and we but we also know that for biocontrol to remain effective we need unceasing research because the rabbit has this amazing ability to evolve resistance and so we need to keep introducing new strains to keep up with that so that we don't um, go back to the old days of rabbits being totally out of control yeah so important carol thank you um Thanks. You, you've made it there without dropping out again. Good on you. And we're going to talk about deer, deer now. I might just come back to Guy and um, and uh, either Carol or Tim after that. But Guy, I wanted to talk about 
the feral deer or the deer that the acclimatization the acclimatizers introduced 18 types of deer they tried to introduce um musk deer reindeer roe deer sicker deer white-tailed deer um thankfully maybe thankfully only six persisted but we know that they are as we speak spreading throughout the country throughout the mainland you're a recreational hunter i learned how do you feel about the role of hunters in spawning this feral deer population that's now um, let loose on australia Andrew, I don't think recreational hunting has really, well, let's put it this way. Recreational hunting for deer has been existent since basically since they were introduced. And I think the evidence today clearly shows with their rapid expansion that it just doesn't work. It might work locally. It might, you know, you might be able to help a landholder out who doesn't have too much land and, you know, you can get up the heads of his gullies and, and you know, knock over a few sandbar, but you don't have a lot. Deer hunting's not generally the kind of thing. If it's if it's fair chase hunting, you get, you know, it's hard to find the animals. It's hard to get in with range. It's hard to pull off a nice, clean killing shot. And once you pull the trigger once, well, they're gone. So it's not the kind of thing that you can mass, you know, destroy them en masse. And it's also, for commercial culling, it's also not the kind of country that's conducive to doing that either from the air. So I don't think it really has any, I think it's shown, it's proven not to have any great effect. And in fact, taking out the bigger, older animals might actually help population. So that's arguable, arguable, I suppose, but I don't think it's had any effect. Thanks, Tim. What are your thoughts about the deer problem and what the role of hunters? I think it's been tragic. It's been a lose-lose situation that, Hunters have bitterly opposed declaration of deer as pests. So, you know, they want the idea that the shooting of deer is a noble sport, that you shouldn't denigrate it by calling it pest control, you shouldn't call deer pests. But the outcome has been deer have proliferated into such massive numbers that there is no choice but to treat them as pests and that that's really... Um, what they didn't want, but they've helped create that situation. I mean, if they had been more cooperative about deer control in the early stages and numbers had been kept lower, it would have been easier to treat deer hunting as something that had a, a place in the system. But, but now I think that you know, people who were willing to accept a small number of deer are realising that uh, the many deer just multiply and you have to consider them a pest, that you have no choice. So, yeah, they've lost the uh, that sense of deer as a game animal rather than a pest. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, I might come to Richard. Um, we've actually got a lot of questions. We're not getting time to answer. So we'll put the answers to most of those on our website um, in, coming through the q and I think we're touching on some of these issues just a bit indirectly. Richard, um, what do you think about the deer problem and what we need to do about it? Oh, it's obvious. Uh, what's happened to, you know, I think they're the second biggest consumer of Kosciuszko National Park at the moment, and they, and they weren't there 20 years ago. There, there were no deer. So they're on the march. They're, oh, I've got a heaps of deer jerky, if anyone wants some, just from my top paddock. Um, and hunting, hunting hasn't, it's not the answer. Uh, Tim's right. They They've always opposed it, and, and and that's that Aussie culture of the same as the feral horse. My hobby or my sport trumps good environmental management or saving endangered species. So while ever we have that that cheap, disconnected culture, um, these kind of arguments win the day. But with a, with a bit of luck, we can turn the corner, and and, and we do start to see people trying to behave responsibly i think trout will be a um <clears throat> a more dignified retreat i think i think that the, they're not going to carry on like the deer hunters or the or the um feral horse crowd i, I think it'll be a fair bit more dignified that we'll, and we will get some streams back for our native species mm. but yeah deer have to be treated as no different to the goat no different you know the the feral pig we've got we need professionals dealing with the problem on mass 
You've reminded me I, I needed to say one thing about um, the Monero Acclimatization Society because we have criticised the trout and they are a major threat to future um, freshwater fish, uh, native freshwater fish. But they did join us with the Reclaim Cosy campaign and we're actually actively supporting the removal of the feral horses. So I wanted to thank them for that at least. So I think that's um, sometimes different perspectives. You might um, you, you might be on different sides of the the argument. Um, Richard, there's a question from uh, Michelle Smith who says, um, if we're harvesting these animals or shooting them um, like deer and pigs or even kangaroos, she's saying it seems dumb to waste them, to waste the carcass. And I think she's interested in, you know, can we create an industry out of this and will that solve the problem? Yeah, uh, I think there's better experts than me. But when I was a kid, there was a bounty on foxes and I, I used to make good money as a kid and, and foxes were hard to get. Uh, when the bounty system went, then the foxes got out of control. Uh, as for carcasses, let's say you're dealing with big numbers like, say, the feral horses in KNP. You're doing the wrong thing ecologically to take every carcass out of that landscape because though those animals consume the resources of that landscape, so it, they actually need to rot back. It's um, it's just an extraction of resources if you try and utilise every every carcass and don't allow nature to have back some of the resources that that those animals consume during their lifetime. So, yeah, yeah, farming's farming. If you can herd animals and you can make a quid out of it, fine. But we should never let that stand in the way of good feral animal control and major culls to reduce the impact that our species need. Now, I saw my first bandicoot the other day in, in the Bidoy. I'd never seen one down in that lower snower country. I've only ever seen them up the Moyang Gale, which is a, 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 the, what people call the Pinch River. And they're there because we've had a couple of good years and the horse density's down. If we allow the horse density to come back in, particularly into the dry times, well then the bandicoot, it, they'll go. Um, so if, but if we were to do a really effective cull now, the longevity in that landscape for the native species would be, you know, really what's required moving forward. Mm. Thanks, Richard. Now we're starting to run out a bit of time, but I might, uh, there was something that Tim, uh, sorry, that Richard mentioned that I, I want to come to Carol to around bounties because I know that uh, she's looked closely at bounties and just she might have a comment about the value of bounties. Carol, do you have something to say about bounties? Yeah, sure. And um, someone suggested I turn off my camera while I talk. To so I'll just become a black um, square for this little while. Um, I mean, Reducing feral animal populations is um, is about biology, and you need to. It's quite simple to eradicate or reduce the population. You need to kill more than be introduced through reproduction or immigration. And sorry, I'm actually not answering the bounty question. Uh, well, I am partly. The bounties throw up all sorts of problems. Um, one is their effectiveness. Uh, you as we've been talking about um, the difficulties of controlling feral animals, you need to kill a very large proportion of the population typically to reduce it. But there's also uh, commonly um, people who try to scam. And, and so with foxes, you know, you can grab a fox from somewhere else. Uh, there's... Mm. There have been ample studies showing that bounties rarely achieve uh, yeah. population reduction. They might achieve certain uh, uh, reduction in certain local areas, but it, the population quickly rebounds. It's just biology. You, and Carol. so, yeah. Great. All right. We're, we're almost out of time, but uh, I thought it was worth hearing that response because uh, it's something that uh, is often put to us as bounties as the solutions. Um, now I've just we we're going to just wrap up in a minute, but Tim, I wanted to come to you because Guy, you 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 wrote about the cane toad. This is the the famous um, catastrophe, the 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 the, the, 
the mistake of bringing an invasive species in when it's um, to try to control an, an agricultural problem that didn't work. Yeah. You, you wrote in your book, uh, Guy, there was no quarantine, no studies and research, no supporting scientific evidence, no formal approval or bureaucratic hoop jumping, nothing. Yet they still brought the cane toad in in 1935 into Gordon Vale and far north Queensland. But because we're out of time, I might just come to Tim because Tim, you're at, you were in the Kimberley at the Mornington Peninsula, and you were there before the cane toad invasion line arrived. Um, talk talk about what you saw. Yes, I was at Mornington Reserve, run by the Australian Wildlife Conservancy, and. Uh, they, would, they checked camera traps while I was there and found the first photo of a cane toad in, entering in the northeast of their area. And I helped prepare cane toad sausages to feed to quoll. So we had a room where we had all these frozen toads chopping up their legs, blending them. It was nauseating in the room. One person had to run out and throw up because you just had the cane toad toxins pervading the air. And it was an attempt to dropped these sausages which had a uh, emetic in them and the idea was that quolls would taste effectively what a toad tastes like and get sick and therefore not eat toads when they came in for real. But it actually didn't work. Uh, virtually all the um, northern quolls in Mornington, they vanished completely. They couldn't find any evidence of survival in Mornington for about, I think it was a year and a half. They picked them up on a camera trap in one remote gorge. So. Um, it was a, a heroic endeavour to save the quolls, but that didn't work. But it, it does look like a few quolls did survive and they'll hopefully come back as some um, toad-savvy predators. Thanks, Tim. Um, the person who was responsible for the cane toads was Reginald Montgomery. I, I, as we wrap this up, really want, I want to ask each of you, the panellists, and I'll finish with Guy. Yeah, people like... Uh, people like Reginald Montgomery and all of the other people who, the, the Thomas Austins that, that introduced these species, um, we don't seem to have both, we don't seem to have learnt the story, um, learnt from our mistakes. Um, how can we be hopeful when we're not learning our mistakes? So I'll start with you, maybe Tim, and then Carol and Richard. Tim. Well I mean, it's this web webinar that gives me hope. You know, guys, guys have written a book. We're all here today talking about it. So it is about ideas change over time. And, and I think, you know, I think it's important to say that acclimatization thinking does live on. But you know, that is why we exist to try and extinguish that kind of thinking. So it is the the, the good ideas winning out. That's that's what we're about. Yeah. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, and it's not only about the uh, introductions that are still to potentially get here and cause more devastation, we also need to deal with the species that are here and make sure that uh, they are effectively, they are subject to effective control programs. I mean, we we really need a lot more ambition and funding when it comes to invasive species and including a lot more research on effective control methods. And that will only be achieved by strong community advocacy and support. And as Tim said, yes, it's encouraging to see that more people are uh, aware of the problem and working to try to um, resolve some of the big problems we face. Thank you, Carol. Rich, Richard, are you hopeful about the future? Oh, uh, yeah, well, I see everything that's happened up until now as cultural. Uh, you know, I've, I've always said it, that we're killing the barrier reef because it's in our culture to do so. And the same with all these, all, you know, the invasive species problems, it's, it's, it's cultural. We've always missed the mark culturally. We've misrepresented our history and we've, we've always uh, declined the actual truth and particularly the truth of landscape and and what country is and what it should be to people. Uh, do I feel that's changing? I, I, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I'm sitting here today. I'm a river god. But, so it's changing. So hopefully at a pace that that will save more species than, than lose. So, yeah, I have hope. Thanks, Richard. Well, Guy, I'll 
I'll finish with you. You've written this, um, this really interesting book and I encourage everyone to read it, The Ferals That Ate Australia. After writing this book, are you hopeful about the future? No, Andrew, I'm not. Um, <laughs> um, if, if, if mainstream Australia can't treat the country properly, if it can't treat the original inhabitants properly and the guardians of this country and we'll, won't listen to them, won't take advice and are only beholden to the big dollar and, and corporations and industries that take it upon themselves to destroy the joint. I don't know how more enlightened people who are in the majority are ever going to be able to catch up and influence enough people to make a difference. Well, well on that note, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, we've got to shift the culture. We've got to We've got to change Australia because Australia is being changed by the ferals. I want to thank the panelists today. Thank you, Guy Hole, for writing a book and, and being part of our thank you. webinar. Thank you. Th Thanks, Andrew. And thank, thank you, you to the panelists, Richard Swain, Tim Lowe, and Dr. Carol Booth. Thank you. Good. Well, we'll wrap this up. There's the a recording of this Q&A will be put on our website. It's under the, the resources section of our website. We'll have another Q&A shortly over the next few months. And we'll answer as many of the questions you can, uh, we can online. It'll be on the website too. And I want to thank you for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.